Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to a conversation about the Ontario Line project with a focus on the Ontario on the downtown segment. My name is Joseph Thornley. I'm the CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for virtual consultations. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event. As such, I'll aim to keep the event on time, ensure your questions are answered as clearly and completely as possible, and make sure as many questions are answered as possible. One important note, this evening is being closed captioned. To use this feature, you can simply click on the CC icon at the bottom of your video player and you'll be able to see closed captioning. Before we begin, Metrolinx wishes to recognize that it operates on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In particular, we acknowledge that the Ontario Line project takes place on Treaty 13 territory with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on these lands and has a responsibility to work with the original keepers of this territory and the many diverse Indigenous peoples living here today. Metrolinx remains committed to engaging with Indigenous peoples and nations on the Ontario Line project. Also, just before we begin, safety is a tradition at Metrolinx. It's fundamental to everything that Metrolinx does. As we look to keep ourselves and those around us safe, I'd like to remind you of an important update for second dose vaccines from earlier this week. Those of you who live in Toronto or in any one of the other areas listed on the screen and who received their first dose of an mRNA vaccine on or before May 9th are now eligible to book second dose appointments. You can do so through the Ontario Booking System, your public health unit, or participating pharmacies and primary care settings. You can learn more at ontario.ca slash book vaccine. And I can tell you, I got my second dose yesterday and I feel like Superman. So I want everybody to have that experience. Please go and get your second dose. So looking at tonight's event, it's part of a series of virtual events Metrolinx is holding this month for all of the Ontario Line station areas. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the Ontario Line stations at Osgood, Queen, Moss Park, and Corktown. If you have questions about other parts of the Ontario Line, you can register for the other events that cover them by clicking on the Live Event Registration button at the top of your screen on the right-hand side of the page, or you can catch recordings which have been posted for events that have already taken place. In addition, tonight, we're going to deal with the Building Transit Faster Act and the newly designated transit corridor lands along the Ontario Line. If you want to follow along or if it, after the presentation, you can download a copy of what you'll be seeing on screen uh, and it's on a button immediately underneath uh, the video presentation. Following the presentation, we're going to have probably about an hour for questions and answers. Again, on the screen just below the presentation, you'll see a ask and vote now uh, icon, and you'll see that a number of questions have already been submitted. Because time is short, um, and if you see a question there that you'd really like to have answered during the live version of the uh, meeting, just vote it up, uh, and uh, that'll make it scroll higher to the top of the screen. Of course, if you don't see your interest uh, addressed, you can submit a question at any time during the meeting and uh, Metrolinx will make an effort to answer the most voted for questions uh, sometime during, the, uh, during the, the next week or so, even if we don't get to it in the live session. Tonight, we also have a call-in option for people who want to ask your question verbally. So right below the written questions, you'll see another button uh, called Join Zoom, where you can join a Zoom audio discussion and you can ask your question verbally. Over there, you'll meet Jackie Chaika, who is acting as the moderator of that room. And after we answer a number of the written questions, we'll go to Jackie. And uh, if you go over there, you'll be able to ask your question verbally. Um, 
The written questions will be a combination of the number of votes and trying to cover uh, as many issues as possible. The uh, verbal questions in the Zoom room will be first come, first served. Again, if you'd like closed captioning, just click on the CC icon at the bottom of this, the video screen. So I'd now like to introduce our panel for tonight. Richard Tucker is the Ontario Line Project Director. Malcolm Mackay is a sponsor for the Ontario Line Project. Quang Pham is a manager on our property team. And Carrie Schaefer is a senior manager on our environmental programs and assessment team. Finally, Renee Afum Boteng is a senior manager on our third party adjacent works team. Welcome, Richard, Malcolm, Quang, Carrie, and Renee. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, happy to be here and uh, very happy to uh, welcome everybody who's uh, joining us tonight. We're making some very uh, important progress on the downtown segment, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, running from Osgood all the way through to uh, Corktown Station. We're also going to be talking about some of the early works that are going to be happening. And through this entire area, we have a large number of uh, heritage considerations and we want to explain to you how we're going to be able to uh, preserve those heritage, uh, important heritage aspects along the Ontario line. Of course, we're going to be talking about uh, what we're doing next and how to keep in touch with us. And then tonight we're also going to talk about the uh, Building Transit Faster Act and the uh, corridor lands. So with that, um, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. So tonight we're uh, talking about uh, the downtown alignment. Uh, it runs from Osgood through Queen over to Moss Park into Corktown. This is a, a dense urban environment and uh, is, uh, is is quite a quite a challenging place for us to be building a subway. Um, but we also have an excellent amount of ridership in this area and uh, important destinations. On the next slide. I'm going to pass it over to Carrie to uh, talk about our heritage considerations in this important area. Thanks very much, Malcolm. So, you know, we wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge the heritage considerations because before we get into some of the detail on the stations, because we do know how important heritage considerations are, specifically in the downtown Toronto area. And, and this is why we've gone to great lengths to sort of catalog and, and uh, detail and identify the known and potential heritage sites all along the Ontario line and within our broader study area for the Ontario line. You might recall back last year, this information was released as a part of all our cultural heritage report. And that's still available online for you to check out if you'd like to do so. So now where we are is we're pulling all of this information forward to ensure that heritage is appropriately considered as we advance our design at these stations. And of course, everything we do is in line with our requirements under the Ontario Heritage Act and the standards and guidelines for provincial heritage properties. We are working with top heritage experts as well as our colleagues at the City Heritage Planning Office to really explore solutions that find the right balance between heritage considerations um, and construction requirements. So some of these things could include retentions of facade in situ sorry, during construction. Um, and we're also exploring options to mitigate impacts by carefully dismantling exterior features into panels that can be stored and reassembled as part of a future station build. So all of this work is still very much underway. Um, and we will be back in the upcoming months to share more about proposed solutions as, uh, at the stations and seek feedback from the public. And of course, all of this will be documented in our environmental impact assessment report, and that's expected to be available for public comment early in 2022. Welcome back to you. Thank you, Carrie. On our next slide, we're going to start talking about Osgood Station. Osgood Station is a, is a vital station in the alignment. It's an important transfer with uh, TTC's Line 1. It's the fourth busiest station on the alignment with uh, um, over 12,000 people coming through during the peak AM hour. The uh, interesting thing about uh, this neighborhood is there's over 8,700 homes that uh, have zero cars. Uh, so they are reliant on transit and uh, it's an important consideration for, uh, for our design. Um, the Osgood uh, station 
Um, also has important transfers with the uh, Queen Streetcar and uh, the uh, station location and the uh, entrance locations are ideally suited to uh, make that important transfer. On the next slide, you can see the locations that we're intending to uh, build stations. I'd like to note that uh, the 3D renderings that we're providing here do have some level of distortion. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, some of the uh, uh, trees and things have been removed from the rendering in order to provide clear view of the, uh, the station entrances. So I just want to clarify that just in case there's any questions. There's no intent to uh, be doing clear cutting of uh, large swaths of these areas. So, uh, but there are will be some tree removals. So uh, this is a, a, a very busy, busy site. Um, you know, being on the corner of uh, University and Queen. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have Richard uh, just talk about some of the construction that we're going to be doing here. Hey, Malcolm. Hey, thanks Alan. very much. Um, well, if you go to the next uh, slide, you can see the permanent condition. Uh, with the two building, two entrance buildings in gray, where we'd enter the uh, station box from the east and from the west. This view is looking to the south along University Avenue, and uh, essentially the station uh, straddles uh, University Avenue um, from Simcoe Street, basically over to the entry box you see there on the corner of the uh, of Queen and University, uh, with the Four Seasons. Uh, Opera Hall on the other other side of the street. Uh, the, the tunnel boring machines head into this location coming from the west. And uh, essentially this this station cavern is actually bored in the rock, uh, the bedrock directly below the uh, line one Queen Street station box. And obviously there's a lot of work to interconnect those two stations and make sure they work uh, both from a passenger flow and from a mechanical uh, air and and uh, fire and life safety viewpoint um, and uh, basically most of the access to get into that keyhole so you can imagine we come down with a shaft and then we dig out underground and expand this into a cavern that's a big enough size for for a station uh, over 100 meters long um, and uh, so that that shaft occurs at the uh, corner where you see the little little house uh, on the north uh, east corner of uh, Queen and University. That's that little a gray house that you see there. Um, going down from there, it, the, the actual construction site area is uh, bigger than that. Uh, not massively bigger, but it is bigger. And you can see that the permanent solution has been minimized as much as possible. So with that, I think we uh, move on to the next station, Malcolm. Yeah, we do. Uh, one thing I would just like to add is that we're working quite closely with stakeholders along the entire alignment uh, and affected property owners to uh, be able to minimize the impact uh, wherever possible. And uh, Osgood Station is a prime example of that, uh, that effort that we're putting forward. The next station in our alignment is Queen Station. It's the number one uh, station for uh, ridership. It has over 16,000 people during its peak hour coming through and over 6,000 transfers from the existing line one. The uh, Queen Station has a, a, a large number of entrances for uh, fire and life safety and uh, is, is vital also because it does also not only link with um, line one, but also the Queen Streetcar. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing is uh, a lot of the construction that you're going to have Richard talk about tonight um, is meant to uh, ensure that the uh, streetcar and surface transit network operates seamlessly during construction and that we minimize our impact on that. On the next slide you'll see that there's a large number of entrances that we're using and uh, a lot of them are existing entrances. We're also in this area um, going to have a very important link to the path network. That way people can get to uh, their places of work in the underground uh, whenever possible. So it's, uh, it's a very important station for us to have a very good transfer and a very good access to, uh, to the path network. I'd like to pass it to Richard to talk about the uh, construction sequencing. Hi. Hi. Um, again, looking at this slide, if if uh, is there a next slide for this presentation? Nope. Sorry. Go back one. Um, if we're looking at 
the same approach that we're talking about in Osgood is is applied here as well, where essentially we're going to be uh, working in a cavern underneath uh, Young Street. There there will be some open cut uh, excavations either side of Young Street to allow access to the station box in this location um, and to allow us to uh, renovate all these entrances that are shown to to allow for the greater number of people that will be coming and going from uh, from this station up to the surface and on to all the destinations all the great destinations in this area uh, again we're, we're we're speaking with all the uh, properties that are involved in terms of coordinating our access and obviously there's a major connection into the past system at this location which is uh, which is part of our planning for the construction in this area and making sure that uh, those will be able to uh, remain in use uh, as construction progresses. Um, back to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Richard. On the next slide, we start talking about Moss Park. Moss Park is uh, also a very high ridership station. It's the sixth busiest station uh, for the Ontario line and uh, has more than 23,000 residents within a 10 minute walk. It's, uh, it's a important station for us because it too has connectivity with uh, the surface network, uh, the st streetcar network, as well as Sherburn Street. The, uh, the, the work here uh, is, is moved off of the uh, um, Queen Street in order to uh, make sure that the Queen Street streetcar can continue to run during the entire process of construction. On the next slide, we'll talk about construction. I'll pass it back to Richard. Okay, looking at, at uh, this slide, you can see that uh, the permanent property requirement is right at the corner of uh, Sherburn and Queen, the northwest corner um, in, front of the, in front of the arena. Um, this, this station box is intended to be an open cut excavation uh, to minimize disruption to the streetcar and to the, uh, the traffic on Queen Street. Um, and uh, essentially to the north of that, there is a temporary staging area that's required to support the uh, open cut excavation, um, similar, similar to what we need to support uh, also keyhole style excavations, because there's a lot of material that comes in and out, obviously concrete and reinforcing steel and other materials that have to go back in. Um, this entire area then will be uh, covered up, uh, backfilled and returned to its park use um with um suitable improvements and uh returning of the landscaping and everything to to a, a better than condition than it is currently so uh with that i think we can uh, move on to the next station so uh the the final build out um of of the station uh includes the uh the station entrance on the uh, northwest corner of sherburn and and queen street uh, we're working quite closely with uh, Toronto Parks and Forestry to uh, uh, develop the programming space when we do reinstate the park. And uh, we're working quite actively with them to schedule our work to be able to be done as seamlessly as possible and maintain the arena being open during the entire uh, time that we're doing the construction. On to the next slide and the next station. So this is Corktown Station. Uh, here is a, a very large and important uh, site for us because this is where we're going to be launching tunnel boring machines and staging the construction from. Uh, this uh, Corktown has uh, 26,000 residents within a 10 minute walk and is very close to uh, the distillery district and uh, St. Lawrence Market are uh, an easy walk away from here. If we go to the next slide, You'll see that uh, there's two sites here. Uh, there's the uh, the north site, which is the one at the bottom. Uh, it is where the uh, station is going to be built and the tunnel boring machines are going to be launched. And then on the south uh, site, which is the blue hatched area, is an area where we're going to be staging the, um, the construction for the tunnel boring machines. But it's also an important site. It's the first parliament site of Canada. So uh, before the first parliament site, it was uh, home to uh, indigenous peoples and first nations peoples. And uh, then the uh, first parliament was built here and it was burnt down by uh, the Americans during the war of 1812. It was subsequently rebuilt and uh, burnt down once again. Uh, after that, it became um, 
the home district jail site uh, for a number of years and then was eventually purchased by Consumers Gas, uh, where it was used as a gasification plant. Uh, during that gasification process, they took coal and turned it into gas. And uh, that was uh, created quite an environmental uh, issue on this site, which the Ontario line is going to uh, come in and, and do some work on and, and clean up. Um, but also part of that is a very exciting opportunity for us to do a very strong archaeologic dig here. And we've been working quite closely with the um, Minister of Heritage, um, the, uh, the City of Toronto, Infrastructure Ontario, ourselves, the elected officials, and we've been, we, we have come up with a archaeological uh, process and work plan that has been agree agreed upon and is going to be starting in the fall of this year. And, and Carrie will talk to us about that in a little bit, but uh, it's really exciting uh, that we're going to be doing this work. It's going to be uh, an ed educational experience for us all. And uh, we're we're looking at ways how we can share this live with uh, the communities. We're also uh, participating in um, uh, the councillors' uh, uh, tables for discussions. We also have tables with the City of Toronto um, to discuss the uh, heritage commemoration efforts, uh, which will lead to the visioning and uh, uh, implementation of a lot of work that the City of Toronto has already undertaken with consultation with the community. Richard, would you like to talk about uh, construction on this site? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I can talk about it all day long. But uh, essentially, the uh, this this site, is, as Malcolm has mentioned, the the north part of the site is uh, where the station will be located. That's uh, open cut excavation to access the station. It will also be the what we call the launch shafts for the tunnel machines, uh, tunnel boring machines, or SEM machines that will be required. Uh, there will be a pair. We anticipate a pair of TBMs that will leave the site and progress uh, westwards uh, through Moss Park towards uh, Queen Street. And there will be another set of machines that will head south uh, out of the site uh, towards the uh, the portal that's located within the uh, Don, the Go Don Yard area. Um, so there, there actually are four, four sets of machines that will be supported out of this location. Uh, which is why we have the requirement for the uh, site to the south to provide enough uh, logistic support for those machines in terms of uh, spoil removal and bringing in the uh, tunnel segments and concrete that are required to support the tunnels themselves, uh, the power requirements for all those machines, and the uh, uh, making sure that uh, you know we have all the uh, supplies we need to build the station uh, on the north side, and uh, then it, it, you know the site will be return to uh, to the condition you see here and um, then there's some TOC opportunities that are are being considered beyond that. Back to you Malcolm or I think maybe it's to Carrie. It is to Carrie. Uh, Carrie if we go to the next slide uh, you can talk about uh, the very interesting um, I, actually this next slide shows actually the uh, the, the actual entrance uh, to the um, to the subway station here at Corktown, as well as the emergency exit, and then it also shows the underground tunnel that goes uh, uh, underneath the first Parliament site and then curves and uh, heads down towards uh, the, the Lower Dawn area. And then on the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the uh, environmental work that's happening at Corktown and first Parliament sites. Carrie, thanks, Malcolm. So. So as you heard, the tunnel tunnel will be launched from the north site displayed here on the graphic, and it will also be home of the future station. If you look to the south parcel of land, this is what's known as the first parliament site, which Malcolm just briefly spoke about. Of course, the home of the first and second par parliament buildings of Upper Canada, the home district jail, and was also the site of a consumer gas company gasification plant up until um, the about the mid 50s. So this is a known archaeological site, and it's also understood to have some contamination present. Um, as you might be aware, there has been a significant amount of archaeological work that's completed on site to date, but there is still quite a bit more to do in terms of archaeological investigations and environmental cleanup. So our intention here is to start this work as early as possible to allow enough time to ensure that the archaeological investigations are completed with the utmost care all prior to construction beginning in 2023. 
Um, and as, as Malcolm and Richard mentioned, this site on the, sub, the southern portion will mostly be used for staging and laid down during construction. So we've built out a very rigorous archaeological program that, uh, that's been slated for this site. And we've been developing this in close collaboration with our colleagues at the City of Toronto, with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as the treaty holders in the area, IO, and the Ministry of Heritage. And we're moving forward with this in the most collaborative way possible. Of course, there'll be many opportunities for the public to stay engaged as we start to embark on this very, very exciting work in the fall. So if we move forward to the next slide, please. So in order to enable all of this environmental and archaeological work to take place, we need to make space for these programs to get underway. And so this is what we call the early works, and it will largely involve um, demolition of the existing buildings in order for us to be able to fully advance the archaeology work without obstruction. So you might recall that there are some um, car dealership and rentals and car washes on the site that, that will need to come down in order for us to um, uh, fully execute the archaeological program. But of course, no demolition will happen on this site without the presence, presence of licensed archaeologists to carefully monitor the work. Um, and Metrolinks, we should note, also welcomes monitors from Indigenous nations to observe and monitor all the archaeological work on site. So the work that falls under the category of early works, as well as potential impacts and the associated mitigation measures, all of this was made available for public review through our draft Corktown uh, Station Early Works Report. Um, that was released in May, just this past month, um, and with a, a period for public comment and review. The comment period has just recently closed, and we, we thank everyone for their review and the comments that they submitted. We're now just working through this with the expectation of an updated final report to be made available on our website in July. So if we please flip to the next slide. So I did see um, in the question in the question and comment section of the report um, a, a lot of acknowledgement of the city's work, and we did want to take a moment to recognize this as well. Um, Metrolinx does recognize the extensive work that the city and its partners have completed here over a long period of time to envision a new future for the first parliament site. And um, the heritage interpretation strategy that was recently completed is, is, is such a fantastic body of work. And we really want this to be the foundation that we build upon as we work to develop a heritage interpretation commemoration plan for the station as well as the first parliament site. So again, we are working in close collaboration with the City of Toronto and Indigenous Nations, IO, the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries to build an interpretation and commemoration plan that really celebrates the rich history of, of the first parliament site. And we'll also be collaborating with the Ontario Heritage Trust as we move forward with all of our work. And we'll be back very shortly to the community groups, as you see on the timeline below. We will be back to community groups and members of the public to solicit feedback and input on the key tenants of our of our plan. So if we flip forward one more slide, please. We wanted I just wanted to take a quick moment to show um, a sample of the types of elements that we'll be seeking feedback on as we work to build out this interpretation and commemoration plan. As I mentioned, our intention here is really to build upon the great work from the city's interpretation strategy. And so we'll be relying on that as a framework um, to develop our plan. We are taking a phased approach here and we'll be starting with a focus on the station. So we will be back to the community in very short order to start having some of these more in-depth discussions on what are the themes that you'd like to see interpreted in the station design. Welcome back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie. Um, so as we're building the uh, the subway, uh, we, we do realize that we're going through communities and, and we're going to be affecting businesses and, and we're here to uh, make sure that local businesses stay accessible, visible and open for business. We have a number of tools of engagement that are available to us uh, from street maintenance to partnerships with the city, events, workshops, uh, marketing campaigns, uh, signage and wayfinding, um, and then partnerships with the businesses themselves and uh, distribution of promotional materials. Our goal is to make sure that during the entire construction process that these businesses remain healthy, vibrant, and uh, in the long term are there when we're finished building this. So uh, we're here to support uh, residents and businesses, and uh, we will be sharing our contact information and be reaching out to you as we start uh, rolling out the Ontario line. 
on the next slide. What's up next? So we've started a cadence of, of regular uh, updates and, and virtual events, and, and we're desperately hoping that uh, when, when safe and uh, the public health restrictions allow us, we'll be returning to you in person, because uh, that, that's the sort of dialogue that we really do treasure. Um, the Corktown Station Early Works will begin, will begin this fall, and uh, with the final Early Works report in uh, July 2021. Um, there's a full engagement uh, that Kerry talked about uh, for the Corktown and First Parliament uh, interpretation and commemoration plan, as well as a review of the archaeological work plan that we're putting forward. The environmental assessment impact reports, uh, the draft is due in, in January 2022, uh, with the final report coming out in April 2022. So, all that, um, we are really just a phone call away and we want to make sure that you're aware of that. We're an email away and uh, pretty soon we'll be uh, in face-to-face in -face conversation with yourselves. Um, on the next slide, we're going to start talking about building Transit Faster Act. And at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Renee. Thank you, Malcolm. So I'm here to talk to you today about the implications of the Building Transit Faster Act and what it means to you and your neighborhood. The province passed the Building Transit Faster Act in 2020 in July, almost a year ago, and it provides Metrolinx with key tools needed to support the successful delivery and completion of the province's priority projects. Construction in urban areas, as you know, may be challenging. And so these tools in the act will also help us to work through some of these challenges in a more proactive manner by first helping us to identify conflicts ahead of time and assess, assess some of these conflicts and if possible, eliminate them to the extent possible. Um, and, and with uh, help and co collaboration with other stakeholders that are impacted. The intent is to avoid project delays. And so we are hoping that through the Building F Transit Faster Act, we'll be able to um, work through some of these conflicts and resulting in fewer inconveniences for neighborhoods and communities. At this time, Metrolinx is in the process of designating some of these lands and transit corridors. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, I'm going to walk you through what the transit corridor lands mean, and, um, and I'm going to try and explain to you how we came about them. So um, through the act, um, the lands that the act requires that we designate the transit corridor lands. Those are lands that are needed for construction of the transit this transit itself, as well as any amenities that are associated with the transit. On this slide, there are two things that you have to bear in mind. Why are we designating these lands and how were these lands designated? Metrolinx now has the means to um, work with people that are within these transit corridor lands, and that's why we designate these lands. The first thing you have to know is that, as I mentioned earlier, working within an urban environment is quite challenging because there are properties and adjacent to the corridor that the, the work that we're doing will likely impact them. So through the designation, we are able to identify the properties that are closest to us and, and be able to work with property owners as they do their own works. It also allows us to anticipate, anticipate project modifications because through the co collaboration that we do with adjacent developers, we are able to identify conflicts that may arise and we are mindful of the surrounding neighborhoods. And so we'll be able to minimize the overall impacts of construction to neighborhoods through the designation of these lands. How did we come about this nation of these lands? So the first of all, we undertook a technical exercise in-house and to identify what the project needs are, where the tunnel will be going, where the alignment will lie, where the station locations will be as um, discussed by Richard and, and Mark Melier. In addition to that, we we identified construction staging areas, access points, emergency exit building locations, etc. Then we undertook a refinement of this um, work, identifying lands that are needed for the staging, as well as interface points where there's traffic access uh, requirements, for example, where would we where we would interact with um, utilities uh, such as um, hydro or or Enbridge or any other utilities. That we, 
uh, that are within the transit corridor areas. We also refine them, being mindful of the community impacts. Um, we try to um, ultimately minimize the extent of our impacts uh, through this, and we identified the lands. So if you look on the diagram up, the transit corridor lands are in the middle where the actual station locations will be and the alignment. Then we added a buffer to that. There's a 10 meter buffer and a 30 meter buffer. The 10 meter buffer is for the area where we we know that um, usually utility works happen and the 30 meter buffer is for adjacent development. You're asking why a 30 meter buffer? Well, the 30 meter buffer is consistent with industry standards and the similar zones that are used by other transit agencies. Also 30 meters is small enough or wide enough so that any works that are happening just along the corridor will likely interfere or interact with our construction work. Bearing in mind that 30 meters has been used very successfully across uh, North America. Next slide. What does this mean to your property? I will use the next two slides or three slides to explain what that means. But first of all, for many people with living within the transit corridor, you may note that um, your your properties will there'll be no impact to the day-to-day -day activities for businesses or landowners or, or people living within the transit corridor lands itself. However, there are three things you need to know. Going forward with the designation of the lands, you'll be all required to get a permit from MetroLinks to do any planned construction works. The other thing you have to notice is also that we will be notified. We will be um, putting the designation on title to, at the land registry office. There are two things that this will make sure uh, this will help us. The first is that people that are within the transit corridor right now will know about the designation, and it will also help us for future landowners that when you're going to search for a property within these corridor, uh, the corridor itself and the buffer, you would now be uh, be able to know um, for future landowners that you are within a transit corridor land to a, a title search process. The third thing is that the, the, the Act gives us, uh, through the Act, we'll be able to access your land, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next two slides. Next slide, please. Getting a permit for planned works. So um, Metro links to the through the Building Transit Factor Act is now a regulatory body that issues permits. The, the intent of this um, this key tool is for MetroLinks to be able to understand, first of all, who and what is happening within the transit corridor as well as the buffer. As I indicated below, um, earlier, working within an urban area is always a challenge, and the intent is to allow us to be able to work with uh, adjacent landowners who are also pursuing work within the transit corridor lands. So the permitting process gives us an opportunity to first identify what's happening. It also gives us opportunity to work out conflicts ahead of time so that if we need to modify our work or we need to inform the landowner doing work of some conflicts, they will be able to modify their work, thereby avoiding delays to our work and theirs. The intent is not to stop anyone from doing their work. And so going forward, if you're working on your home and you're doing an extension, for example, or doing any exterior work that requires you to expand the existing footprint of your home, you may need a permit for Metrolinx. And it's, um, it's on, on you to come talk to us. We have made it very easy for, for the permitting process to go on. Um, one of the other things you need to know is that if you need a permit from the city, it's very likely that you will need, a if you need a building permit from the city, it's very likely you need a permit from MetroLinx as well. The permitting process is also very, it's free for Metro, uh, to get a permit from MetroLinx because we know that this is more of a coordination exercise and so we'll work through the review with you. If you're doing internal works such as finishing your basement or working on your roof or plumbing work or planting a tree for example, you do not need a permit from MetroLinx. And so if you're not sure, please reach out to the email address um, noted up here and we'll work and answer your questions. The email address is monitored frequently and we will be able to respond to you. We would want to make sure that you do not have to redo your work at any point in the future if you go if we go through the permitting process and we'll be able to identify conflicts and remove them ahead of time. Next slide please. Notice on title as I indicated um, earlier the 
as part of the act, we are required to notify landowners of this designation. And that is what we've been doing of late. Um, if you're a homeowner or a property owner, by now you would have received a letter from Metrolinx. We have mailed out letters to affected landowners who are within the transit corridor lands. This does not this does not mean that there will be restrictions with regards to renting or leasing or selling your home. It's just a notification to let you know that you're now within the transit corridor lands. And homeowners um, who are who have received this notification, we've asked you if you have tenants as well to notify them through the through the um, channels that are available to you. Next slide, please. Accessing uh, the homes with accessing property property within the transit corridor lands. The, so as I indicated earlier, there are some key tools that this uh, act provides. One of the things that is very common during construction is the need to do ex um, investigations and inspections. So through the act, we will now have permission to enter um, and and do investigative works. To be able to do that, we will notify land, landowners or homeowners if there is a need to ever enter your property. We do not anticipate to have to do that. This uh, enter a lot of homes because of uh, the nature of our studies. But if we have to do that, we will notify you and work with you and we'll reach out to you to make sure that we can access your property um, at the right time in the day. We'll give you enough notice, 30 days um, sometimes, and uh, we'll work with you to ensure that we can access uh, your property. We will not be entering your home. It would mainly to be on, on the property to do some investigative, environmental investigative works, for example. The other option that we have as well um, with regards to the, to the act is the ability to remove obstruction. So during the planning or construction phase of the work, if we identify that there is an obstruction on your property that is a hindrance to the construction, for example, we may need to enter your, uh, your property to remove that obstruction. The same the same approach we will be using earlier is what we'll use here. We'll work with you to identify the time to access your property and we'll give you time if it's possible. If it's an emergency, we may have to access your property soon. We will let you know as well. We may not be able to give you enough notice, but we will work with you. And if there is a need to restore your, your property uh, or compensate for the work that we carry out on your property, we would work also work with you on that. So just uh, note that Metrolink is open and available and the Act provides all these uh, measures to ensure that you are protected at the same time. Metrolinx is going to work with you on this. Next slide. How will how will my property be affected? Again, as I'm, uh, how would I know my property is affected? As I mentioned earlier, we have been sending out notices as part of the Act to homeowners that are impacted within the 30 meter buffer or the transit corridor lands. Um, if you haven't received a letter, it's may, likely it's in the mail and we, you would be getting one soon. If you live in a condo, we've asked the condo boards to notify homeowners um, who are on the, on, on, through their usual, um, usual communication channels. If you are renting, the same applies to you. We have provided the notification to property owners and they will be reaching out to you. If you receive a letter, it doesn't mean that um, your property will be accessed or your property will be up for um, sale or temporary use. It only means that we are notifying you as uh, required by the law to notify you of this designation. And if you have any questions, um, as Malcolm in indicated earlier, Metrolinx is just an email or a phone call away. We will be happy to work with you to explain to you what it means to your property. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Renee. Okay. And um, so uh, if, if you do have any questions about this, uh, visit uh, metrolinks.com backslash property um, to learn more about the property lands or give us a call. We're, if you'd like to talk to us, we would be happy to hear from you. And on the next slide, this is how you can reach us. Um, you can reach us at our uh, website at Ontario uh, or our email site at Ontario line at metrolinks.com. You can phone us at 416-202-5100 or go to our website at metrolinks.com backslash Ontario line. We really do value your feedback. We do, uh, we would like to hear from you. Um, if 
if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, we're, we're, we're grateful to hear from you and uh, we're here to answer any questions that you might have. So with that, um, I'd like to give it back to Joseph and we can start the, uh, the fun part uh, where we get to actually engage uh, the community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Malcolm, Carrie, Richard, Renee, Quang. We do have questions. We've got lots of questions. In fact, just while you were speaking, the number of written questions doubled. Uh, and uh, so lots of people were coming in. And I understand that there's a good turnout in the Zoom room tonight. So here's what I'm going to propose that we do. Uh, the written questions are here. We're going to try and take a few of the most voted for questions and get them answered at the beginning. But then we'll go straight over to the Zoom room because a question that has not yet been asked verbally is a question that is lost if people don't get the chance to ask it. Whereas to reassure everybody, Metrolinx will be with the written questions, making an effort to answer the most popular questions. So even if we don't get the written questions done tonight, um, your, uh, your, your questions will be answered. Also, uh, when you come back here, you'll be able to see the presentation. Uh, there will be a recording of it and you'll be able to see all of the information as well. So let's uh, take this first question and uh, it deals with Osgood Hall. Will the historic fence and grounds of Osgood Hall be affected in any way by the construction of Queen and University Station? So the historic area. So I, I can I can start with this and then I'll pass it over to uh, Carrie and Richard. Um, so uh, the, the Osgood uh, Hall main entrance, uh, in order to have good connectivity with uh, the the surface network and be able to construct, there's there's only four corners, five five areas that we investigated for potential entrances, and uh, we've we've aligned on on these two entrances that you saw tonight. And um, yes, there, there will be an impact to the uh, historic fence there. But the thing is, is that we're, we're going to reinstate it. Um, we're, we're going to be protecting the fence. We're going to be taking it away. And then we're going to be rebuilding it and recreating um, that space um, with a new station uh, uh, built in. So, um, Kerry, maybe you'd like to just talk a little bit about the heritage pre preservation uh, process. For sure, thanks, Malcolm. And I think you, I think you, that was a great introduction. And you know, I, as as Malcolm said, at avoidance is, is our, our our preference at, at at all times. However, we have determined that this is the location that the station needs to go to maximize, um, you know, the the connections for for the Ontario line. And and with that, we are trying to minimize the footprint of the station to the greatest extent possible. But we acknowledge that there will be some impacts to the fence and in the grounds and so as Malcolm indicated we will have to remove a, 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 a section of the fence while the construction work is underway but what we will do during that time it will give us an opportunity to do some restoration on the fence um, before we eventually reinstate it and so we're work, again we are working to minimize the impacts as much as possible where we will be working with them um, the Law Society with the city, uh, the city heritage planning, as well as Ministry of Heritage on this to make sure that, you know, we aren't we aren't impacting an inch more than we need to on this property. Um, and we will we'll be back to provide more updates on that as we work through the designs. OK, thank you both. You showed us uh, the overhead views, uh, the layouts of the station. And Hayden Poon has a question about Moss Park and Corktown. And Hayden is wondering why those stations will only have one entrance building. And he, he points out that TTC has been adding second entrances to a lot of its stations for safety and access reasons. So one entrance only at Moss Park and Corktown? So uh, I, I can start off uh, with the uh, the answer. Uh, so we have modeled these stations uh, to make sure that we have adequate uh, life safety uh, entrances. But in, in those instances where we only have one entrance, we also have an emergency exit that's being built in as part of it. And uh, you, you may have seen that on the, uh, the, the little small building um, on the Corktown site uh, on the south side of it. Um, but we also do have uh, the uh, 
we, we've created uh, accessibility with uh, uh, escalators and two elevators to make sure that we have redundancy built into every single entrance that we're building. And uh, we, you know, we've done the work to make sure that they are safe and that there's a, a way for us to be able to get EMS and emergency services down to uh, platform should it be required and obviously get our customers and patrons out of the facility uh, if, if required. Uh, Richard, uh, would you like to elaborate further? Sure. Um, actually, one of one of the things, uh, the advantages of building new stations from scratch is that uh, we can design them in such a way as to uh, to optimize them with respect to the pedestrian flows and the the number of passengers we expect in the station. Plus, we can um, try wherever possible. As Carrie mentioned, one of the things we try to do is minimize the footprint of uh, our station buildings in the long term. And and certainly at Moss Park, it, uh, being in a park, we want to make sure that the footprint is the absolute minimum, just like we do at Osgoode Hall. And in that situation where uh, you know we're not interacting with an existing TTC station, uh, we have the opportunity to to design the station in such a way that we have a um, a single headhouse that, uh, as Malcolm says, has uh, dual elevators and e escalators, everything you need for vertical mobility, and ensure that it's a, a safe, comfortable um, you know ride for our passengers to access and leave the station. Um, and to address any um, you know strollers or or mobility issues or anything like that. Um, and at the same time, we can work our our emergency exits and entrances in such a way that there's a safe a safe redundant path of travel uh, back up to the surface that doesn't uh, work with the main route, but is is separated from a fire and life safety viewpoint. But we end up in the same headhouse, so it's it's a it's a great design. It's really interesting, and uh, I think it's a really great example of how we work very very hard to make sure that we minimize the permanent, the both the temporary, but also very much so the permanent impacts on parks and and significant spaces like Osgoode Hall. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, take a look at Corktown uh, more closely. Um, o Calderon is asking about the necessity of using the first parliament site for uh, tunnel work staging. Uh, and the question is, why isn't the north block that has staples and porch, which seems quite large, why isn't that enough space for the tunnel work sta staging? Um, I, I can start off and, uh, you know, Malcolm, feel, feel free to jump in if I miss anything. Um, the uh, yeah, it does look like a big space. I agree with you, um, but it, it, it's it's interesting in that a lot of that space is actually taken up by the uh, excavation required for the station itself. And as such, there's uh, no ground to stand on except, uh, you know, 30, 30 or so meters down in a hole. Um, as a result, we need to have other space with from which to stage. And and as we talked about in the uh, presentation, this is a significant, significant uh, launching point for the uh, for the uh, tunnels. Um, in that we have uh, four machines that will be departing here: two going to the uh, to the west, and two going to the south uh, and east into the into the Don Yard area. So it, th there's there's a lot of of activity at this location, and to support those uh, four machines and the tunneling, the four tunnels, um, it it's just requires a, a lot of a lot of area with it with the spoils, simultaneous spoil removal, and simultaneous delivery of all those liner segments and concrete that's needed for those tunnels. Okay, thank you for that. Let's stay there for a second. Uh, there's a question about uh, the. Um, the Parliament Square Park, uh, and is it going to be preserved? Uh, and uh, the questioner, uh, Chris Horn, I'm sorry, uh, it's just changed. Allison uh, is asking uh, about the possible you uh, about the possible use of the land for condo buildings. Um, and uh, can you comment on that? Will the park be preserved, or is that going to turn into uh, buildings? 
Yep, no, I, I, I can talk to that. So uh, the Parliament Square Park is going to be preserved. We're actually working quite closely with the city to uh, install a new bike path uh, across the northern edge of that, uh, that site so that there'll be a, a detour during construction. So uh, note the, that that space will be available for your enjoyment and, and pleasure, uh, as well as uh, improved um, when we are uh, when we're building the uh, with the city, the bike path. OK, good. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, we've taken some written questions here, but I understand there are even more hands up in the Zoom room. So let's go over there. Jackie Chaika, are you in the Zoom room and ready to uh, tee up some verbal questions? So thank you, uh, Joseph, for that introduction and welcome everybody to the Zoom room. Uh, for those of you just joining us in this section of our virtual open house, we'll be giving an opportunity to community members to ask their questions live uh, via Zoom. For those wanting to ask questions on Zoom, please click on the yellow button titled Join Zoom on the Metrolinx Engage page for tonight's meeting, and you'll be redirected to the Zoom room. Having said that, we'll be answering questions in the order of hands raised, and we have a a nice and healthy list so far. Um, and as a reminder, please try to keep your questions clear and concise so we can get to as many people as possible. Uh, and with that, we'll go to our first question coming from DH. DH, go ahead and unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. And actually, I have a very quick administrative question, if you would permit me to dispense with that first. Uh, thank you for saying that you will be making an effort um, to make the answers available to us. I just wondered where we might look for the answers to questions that were raised either in the Zoom chat or uh, directly onto your site. Well, I, it's Joe. I'll answer that quickly. The questions, the written questions will be on this page that you're on right now. And where there's a Slido right now, that'll be replaced with the Q&A section. So you'll be able to come back here anytime and see the questions as well as the answers that Metrolinx uh, is able to provide. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to thank you for confirming um, that we, uh, you, um, will be acting in a way that uh, engages our Indigenous partners and they will be represented, represented, represented sorry, in matters pertaining to archaeology and I hope also environment and also station design. So thank you for that. Um, my specific concern this evening was the Parliament, uh, First Parliament Park, uh, which you've answered um, in a previous question and I've seen in little green patches through your uh, renderings. So I would just wonder if you would mind confirming that um, no staging, no uh, a third party assessment of the trees, uh, the impact on trees through boring activities, for example, uh, which is pretty well documented um, to cause negative impact, uh, has been carried out as part of the environmental assessment. And that in fact, the first parliament park will survive short term and long term, uh, this process intact. So yeah, I, I, I can answer that question. Uh, th thank you very much for participating in the Zoom room. It's nice to actually talk to someone. Um, yeah, so uh, our, our, our tunnels are, are generally uh, very deep. Uh, they, they, they don't affect trees. Um, but where and if we do um, uh, affect a tree, um, we have a, uh, and Kerry can elaborate further on this, a, a replacement program that's agreed with with the city. And uh, uh, we, would, we would certainly be uh, repairing anything that we do damage. Um, but we're not expecting, in particular, the trees that are along the north edge of uh, the, uh, the Parliament Square uh, Park. Uh, to be damaged in any way. And uh, like I said, we're working with the city right now to uh, build a pike path right along there um, and are, are looking forward to that. So uh, I think it's all that's all good news for that park. And, and Carrie, maybe you could just touch on the uh, tree replacement uh, numbers. 
Sure, thanks, Malcolm, and and thanks for the question. As Malcolm as Malcolm mentioned, I think we are quite deep there, so we don't anticipate impacts to trees. But it, it, as a general approach, Metrolinx has a, 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 a quite a sophisticated vegetation compensation guideline that we follow that dictates how we we replaced um, vegetation and trees should we should we have an impact to them. And that's available on our website for you to check out if you'd like to. In this area in a public park, if, if a tree were to be removed, it would be it would be replaced at a three to one ratio. Um, and you know, we're advancing, you know, we are we are looking for opportunities for plantings all the time. We recognize that, that that there's there's community benefits to that, and we'll be back to talk to you more about that. But in this particular instance, we don't we don't expect any impact to the trees in the park. In terms of an environmental assessment, I heard you mention as well at the, within your question, a lot of this will be documented in um, the environmental impact assessment report, which will be available for public review um, early next year. Thanks for the question. Thanks so much, Malcolm and Carrie. On to our next question, coming from Michael. Michael, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, a, a couple of issues here. Uh, one, the south side of the Cork Town uh, Station, which is now considered the staging area for the Cork Town Station. Um, will the south side of Cork Town, where the actual First Parliament, Gale Railroad, and Indigenous sites uh, they're located, be used for boring to other stations and staging for other stations? And secondly, where are the replacement trees being planted? So I, I can I can start to answer your question, Michael. Um, so what what we're doing with the two sites that are being made available, um, there's uh, that will go to our project company, and they will be using those sites to uh, stage construction of the tunnel boring machines. But you know they they may store things for uh, some materials uh, that are being used up at Moss Park. Uh, they may have different storage sites that they lease uh, throughout the city. So there's a number of, of things where we're not necessarily limiting their um, their use to strictly the Corktown station. Um, because we want them to be efficient and we want them to, uh, you know, not be moving materials through uh, downtown. They, you know, we, we would like them to minimize their footprint in Moss Park. Uh, so th there's there's a lot of ambitions that we're trying to uh, to to realize there. Um, and uh, Kerry, did you want to talk about the uh, the, her uh, the uh, environmental side? For sure. So I, I think the question is, where will the trees be replanted? So great question. And we're exploring a lot of opportunities for that. We recognize there's not always a lot of space to, places to plant trees in dense downtown urban areas. So we'll be working, we are already working with the City of Toronto to identify locations. We're also working with the Toronto Reason Conservation Authority to try and identify hyper-localized opportunities in and around the, the project. So in this case, the Corktown Station, where there might be opportunities for planting. And this could include around the Corktown station itself in the future. So this is, this is actively underway. Um, and we'll be back to, to share more about that as more details become available. Great, thanks so much, Malcolm and Carrie. On to our next question coming from Liz. Liz, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, my name is Liz Driver and I'm the director at Campbell House Museum on the northwest corner of University and Queen opposite Osgood Hall. Um, first Parliament site, Osgood Hall, you are touching upon some of the earliest history in our province. So I've noticed that people have recognized the importance of the 1867 heritage designated fence. Um, what hasn't maybe been touched upon is the important of that importance of the garden space and how that contributes to the appreciation of the um, from the earliest 1830s building. Now I feel that there are solutions to possibly solutions to putting the what you call the box station within Osgood Hall Garden. So my question to you is, have you discussed with the city the possibility of closing 
one or more lanes of traffic on University Avenue to allow the box station to move outside of the Osgood Hall fence? And if so, uh, what, you know, what can you tell us about those discussions? Thank you very much. Hi, Liz. It's, it's Malcolm. I, I can answer some of that question. So we have looked at many options for uh, the siting of the uh, station entrance. We are working quite closely with the City of Toronto on, on all options. Uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the, the site here um, and the work that was undertaken as part of the Relief Line South was also incorporated into the evaluation of options here. And uh, so the answer is yes, we've had a discussion with the city about uh, uh, lane changes in, um, in, on University Avenue and, uh, and what might be available there. And uh, right now, the current plans that we have are uh, based on the feedback that we've received. And, uh, you know, once again, as uh, we've mentioned before, we're very actively pursuing um, ways to minimize our footprint on this very important site. And we recognize the importance of the site and, uh, and respect it. And when we are, are finished here, we will be reinstating um, those heritage features so that they are preserved and, and fit with the building of uh, you know, a major uh, transit site, uh, in, interchange station um, in downtown Toronto. It's it's not the easiest construction in the world to do, and and Richard went has gone to great lengths to use for methods of construction that really do minimize the footprints and impacts um, to the the road networks, the transit networks, and uh, and the people that are are using the site during construction, and and our our permanent takes and permanent impacts are being very actively managed to, to be uh, as minimal as possible. Back to uh, you, Jackie. Thanks, Malcolm. All right, we're gonna go to our next person on the list, Alexandra. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you. Um, okay, so my question is, I recently learned in our new local paper, The Bridge, that in the Metrolinx proposal, there are plans for four residential towers and one commercial high-rise tower on the first parliament site. I'm pretty disappointed it has been addressed thus far, but my question is, how do we square this use with Metrolinx's great respect for the community plans for this site, which included a new library, food services, cultural hubs, and affordable housing? And what is preventing Metrolinx from building the Corkdown station as per your mandate and then working with the city to build the facilities the city and local residents spent years planning. So Alexandra, I, 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 can, I can take that one on. We, we actually do have a very active dialogue with the city and you know, we're very, um, very appreciative and respectful of the work that's been undertaken by uh, city staff and, and create TO staff and the work they've put into uh, some of the, uh, the plans for the site. So, we do have an active uh, dialogue with them about a, a community space, a, a library space, about uh, some of the uh, commemoration and interpretation elements that they've developed. So, uh, you know, as part of our delivery, we we do have a, a transit-oriented community part of it, and uh, we're working quite closely with the city at those tables to uh, deliver on the ambitions that the city has and, and, and the ambitions that have been discussed with the community. So uh, there is a, this is the start of a dialogue with a, a community on, on the uh, transit oriented opportunities. And uh, we, we will make sure that uh, Infrastructure Ontario, um, you know, who's leading the transit oriented community will, will be uh, Fully, uh, fully out there with uh, the community to develop these plans and uh, and realize the ambitions of everyone involved. Back to you, Jackie. Thanks so much, Malcolm. All right, the next person on our list is Andre. Andre, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, since we're on the topic of transit-oriented communities, uh, will Moss Park be designated a TOC? 
uh, uh, Andre, I can answer that one. No. Great. Thanks so much, Malcolm. Back to you, back, back to you Jackie. <laughs> yes. Short and sweet. Um, all right, we've got our next question coming from, from Lester. Lester, go ahead. Oh. Hi. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, I just had a couple of questions here. One was, it's just something I just want to reemphasize. I know it's come up at working uh, the working group and stuff, but just the uh, on noise mitigation. Um, you know, we're always in uh, in fear of these uh, projects, especially uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, province province or with uh, Metrolinx that they can override the uh, city bylaws and operate on 24 hour uh, basis. Now on the, uh, I was looking through, I kind of looked late at that, at the, uh, at the uh, early works uh, 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 plan A was the, uh, on that they had, uh, they had mentioned several buildings in the area that might be impacted. And one of them was like five mil, which is actually part of a, of a high rise, 33 mil street. And I'm just wondering if you've identified uh, buildings in the area that might be impacted by the, uh, by the noise, uh, construction noise and how you're going to, uh, to work with the community on uh, ensuring that, uh, that it is kept to uh, uh, an acceptable basis. Thanks so much, Lester. So I can I can I can t try to address those those uh, noise and vibration questions. Um, appre I appreciate the concern here, and you know this is uh, noise and vibration is one of our, our top considerations in uh, in everything we do. Is as as uh, deliver as people who deliver transit projects, we encounter this quite a bit. Um, and so maybe I can just talk a little bit about the process that would how we assess noise and vibration, and then the commitments that we write into our contracts on this. So. We do, as a part of our environmental assessment process, we do very sophisticated modeling to sort of determine what, using the means and methods, what the, the potential impacts can be on for noise and vibration on, on the local area. So we kind of establish a zone of influence there. Um, and then we that helps us determine where and when we need to provide mitigation to bring things down to acceptable levels. So that all gets documented in our environmental assessment process, and we'll be back out to share more information on that as design progresses. Um, and what that does is that all gets pulled forward into our contract language, and we set up very specific criteria for noise and vibration and limits for contractors to adhere to. So you're right to note that you know some bylaws don't apply to us, but in some cases we're more stringent than that because we apply we we apply our own criteria, and we 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 try to ensure that. We're, we're well within acceptable limits for, for, for daytime and nighttime noise. And before any construction can start on, on any of our locations, we require our, our constructors to, um, to complete their own noise and vibration management plans that clearly outline how they're going to meet the criteria we've, we've set, set out and um, where they're going to be providing mitigation, whether that's through hoarding, whether that's through specific types of equipment, things like um, broadband backup beepers. A lot. Some of these things were prescriptive about in our contracts. Um, so none of the none of the work can can go ahead until that that takes place. And then during during construction work, we set up. Um, we require our constructors to set up noise and vibration monitors throughout the throughout all of the construction sites to ensure that they're meeting the limits that we've set out. And so that we can sort of adapt as we go. If we start to see things are creeping up, we know that in real time. We set alerts so that we can we can um, we can veer and change direction if we need to. So I know I, I know we've heard from the communities around court before about this, and I believe we have some meetings set up to talk in more detail about it. Um, but I think that this is you know this is something we do for all of our projects. And just to reiterate and stress, this is. Noise and vibration is 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 of the utmost importance to us, and we're really committed to working with the community here on how we can keep these on, uh, that all of this at an acceptable level for you. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right, our next question comes from Chris. Chris, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, a quick comment. Um, I like Daniel's uh, description that the properties are being made available. 
I, I guess that's almost a euphemism for expropriation. And from what I've heard tonight, I'm wondering why with so much community involvement still taking place, why there is a rush to expropriate the site by August. That's just a comment in general. My main question is, with the line coming from south of the first properties, the first parliament site, is it coming through the distillery district? And if so, what impact is it going to have on the condominiums that are, and, and I guess the businesses um, in the distillery district, historical bit, distillery district? So Chris, I can, I can start that, uh, that answer. Um, so we're working quite closely with uh, the distillery district and, and the BIA in the area. We're, uh, our, our alignment actually is, is a little bit south of the actual distillery district. Um, and we, uh, we've already looked at uh, our alignment and where we're going um, with respect to the condominiums and and we've we've managed that and we've spoken to some of the developers down there so so that is all very well uh, very well uh, coordinated right now um, Richard do you have anything to add about uh, construction uh, well I mean um, the 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 driver for the the timing in that particular case, in terms of the uh, that those sites, is 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 driven is a backwards looking program, starting from when when the site needs to be delivered. And um, one of the things that uh, we're having to deal with is to do the archaeology and the various clearances that we need um, to to allow construction it takes quite a bit of time, and a, a lot of that work is seasonal in nature. That you know we can't. Uh, we can't be trying to dig, uh, you know, artifacts or trying to expose artifacts for archaeological consideration uh, that are frozen in the ground. Um, so that limits us to works during, you know, not during the, the depths of winter. Um, so we basically have to get there. We have to demolish the buildings that are there, the, uh, the car wash and such, to allow us full access to the site so we can do the proper archaeological and environmental investigations. Um, and then that leads into allowing us then to move into construction. Um, currently, the uh, uh, the RFPs for the two for the contractor here, South Civils, is intended to close in July of next year, um, and uh, the work will will move ahead from there. And uh, given the archaeological work and the demolition work, that all ends up uh, starting and finishing up in about uh, March of 2023, which will allow that uh, proponent enough time to make a design for the station, get their tunneling machines and things mobilized. And, uh, you know, it's it's really quite tight, as you can see. We're actually, you know, delivering the site a few months after uh, after the financial close. Uh, so we, we've given as much time as we possibly can. And and I understand it, it can look a bit rushed. And uh, uh, we certainly feel the pressure on a day-to-day -day basis. But... Uh, uh, it is done in, in the intent of making sure there's enough time to do a proper archaeological study and a proper uh, environmental study prior to getting going on construction. Thank you, Richard. Um, Jackie, before we uh, jump to the next question, I, I just, uh, when I answered Andre's question, he asked whether we were planning TOC at Moss Park, and I just said no, and, and you know, it's... Uh, we, we aren't, but um, what we are planning to do is work quite closely with uh, forestry and parks so that when we do reinstate the park that they get the programming space developed the way that they want it. They, it's all going to be new for them and this is an opportunity for them to rejuvenate the park and uh, you know we're excited by that and we're going to be working very collaboratively with the city and the parks and forestry on making sure that when we leave there it's an absolutely gorgeous beautiful park. Back to you Jackie. Thanks, Malcolm, for that uh, addition and clarification. Just cognizant of the time, it's 7.48, and we are scheduled until 8 p.m. We have four more people on our list, uh, and I know there's a few people who have asked for follow-ups, but unfortunately, we won't be able to, to do that so that we can reach all the people on our list. So with that, uh, we have Cynthia next. Cynthia, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. 
I'm going to start with a quick comment and then ask my question. So I just wanted to uh, expand on Alexandra Hartford's comment that there's, uh, in the sense that I think there's a lot here that we're having trouble squaring between your commitment to working with the community and the reality that we're seeing unfolding. So, uh, for instance, the development plan, which is not is IOs, not Metrolinks, but you're working together, and this is all in the aid of of transit. The development plan for the first Parliament site is not remotely consistent with the community work that has been done for the last 20 years. It isn't. It is. It is impossible to understand how you'd square that with the um, with the master plan that is under uh, under construction. Osgood Hall, I'm shocked to find that you're actually going to take part of that historic landscape. Like it is a very very important landscape. That is shocking. It's completely unacceptable. And how is that consistent with community aspirations? And then there's the historic properties, um, the fabric, city fabric at uh, Queen Spadina and King and Bathurst. This is all under threat and when you talk to us about respecting the community and working with the community, I don't know what that's supposed to mean and so I'm just like I'm a bit shocked by this. Um, but I'm going to move to my question, I'm going to leave that there. Um, my question is really about the construction activity, not the early work so much as the overall construction activity. And I know, Carrie, we've talked about this in the first parliament uh, working group. Um, I'm very concerned that the RFP is going out for the South Civil um, project. And you have uh, assured us, Carrie, that there are protections, that you have uh, very elaborate protections in the contract language. I'm asking if you will share that with us we need to see that contract language. How do we know that you're actually covering the things that are going to be important to us on the ground when we have, like, what is the estimate of how many cubic meters of, of, of rubble and soil? What did you call, there was a word for, you know, what's the tunnel um, machines um, uh, create the whatever, detritus. Anyway, so there's going to be, there are going to be trucks, there are going to be, you know, uh, lined up to take this stuff away? Are they going to be working 24-7? I mean, I think we really need, uh, if I, we've had bad experiences, very bad experiences here, and it's a very dense uh, residential neighborhood. Um, there are safety concerns. There are, um, there are noise um, concerns that are not vibration. It's just, you know, sort of trucks and movement of goods. There is, uh, is air quality and environmental concerns. So we really need to see that language. It needs to be made public or at least available to the working group before that RFP goes out, before it's too late to change it, because that is the experience we've had in the past that can really catch up the community. So can you, can you, can you do that? Provide those parts of the, the contract language to us? The RFP language, Thanks. rather. Thanks so much, Cynthia. I really appreciate the question. And, and yes, I know we I know we've talked about this a bit before and really appreciate um, you and the community's concerns around this. And I think we are setting up some meetings to to walk through this and talk about this in, in more detail. Some of what you've you've mentioned is environmental, some of it is more um, to do with uh, the delivery team and design and how I think you're talking about tunnel spoils, um, how the, how some of the excess material gets carted out and haul routes and things like that. Appreciate the concern and I know you, you shared how um, there's been some challenges with previous um, construction activities in the area. So we do want to hear more about this and if there are and if there are um, things that we can do that we can add to our contracts to make them um, more specific to your experience, we will work to do that. So um, I th I we can commit to coming to talk to the t the group and sharing what the, what are some of the commitments are that we've made in our contracts and seeing how that works for the community and seeing what we can do to make sure that we're limiting and minimizing impacts to this to this area as much as possible. Thanks. So, um, Cynthia, I, I'd like I'd like to just follow up on uh, you know a couple of your 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 comments early in in your question, and 
As you're well aware, we're we're trying to build a, a subway line through the heart of Toronto, and it's very hard to find sites, especially in an old city like Toronto, that don't have some heritage uh, designation, especially when you want to try and pick up interchange sites at um, King and Bathurst, where you, you want to be picking up the Bathurst streetcar, you want to be picking up the King streetcar, and along Queen Street, the same sort of thing. So... You know, we're working very hard and Kerry's working very hard to make sure that the uh, heritage elements um, are, are going to be preserved and protected um, as, as part of our work. And, uh, you know, our, our, our work at Osgood Hall is, 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 is entirely focused right now on what we can do to minimize that footprint. Um, you know, it, it, it is the right location for a station entrance from a, a transit and, and space point of view. Um, but now we have to work out how we can build that and, and minimize that impact. So I can I can certainly uh, tell you that we are fully committed to that. Um, and then and then you asked some question about the uh, uh, TOC, the Transit Oriented Community Work. I, again, you pointed out that is being led by uh, Infrastructure Ontario. But later this summer and and in the fall, they are going to be very actively engaging uh, the communities to uh, get feedback and and make sure that the uh, the plans do um, inspire and 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 provide the uh, the aspirations that the community have. So. Um, I, I would suggest that when that engagement starts, that uh, you, you please please be front and foremost in that uh, engagement. Uh, I'm I'm sure that they would welcome it and your thoughts. So, um, if we go back to Jackie, thank you very much. Thanks, Malcolm. So it seems a few people have dropped off. Um, so we just have two more questions left. Uh, Hayden, you're next. Go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Hayden from Wires University, I think Urban Regional Planning. Um, I have a question related to the tunnel boring machine. So I know that in Eglinton cross down, the tunnel boring machine doesn't actually cross line one. They they go close to it and then put it up to the ground and then go across on the ground and then put it back and then, then go continue tunneling. But I'm sure like, because we're in downtown, there's no way to put the panel machine up and then cross line one. So I'm just asking what measures are you taking to ensure the safety, the safe operation of line one um, during your construction progress process? Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, the first thing is it's a little bit different. In the case of uh, Eglinton, they were in uh, what they call glacial till which is essentially all the soil and rock and boulders and things that are left over after the glaciers retreated at the end of the last ice age. Um, and, but in the downtown, we are actually in solid rock and uh, well below the uh, levels of the, uh, where, whereas line one tends to sit right on top of the bedrock, the bottom of the station boxes, both at Osgood and Queen. Um, and we're probably uh, approximately 10 to 15 meters below that, uh, before the, the crown of the cavern. Um, so the, the, the rock itself is, is the support for the bedrock of the city of Toronto that holds up all those high rises and the CN Tower and the Sky Dome and all the things you see. Uh, that very rock will continue to support those station boxes. Uh, we also, of course, as part of the program, just to make sure, uh, we do install a vast amount of monitoring, real-time monitoring uh, technology in those stations to detect any movement at all in the in the track bed or the station box itself. Uh, we have conducted LIDAR surveys of the stations themselves. So a LIDAR is a laser uh, detection. It detects a cloud of points and is a very sensitive device that can tell uh, whether the station has moved at all, cracks have developed, anything of that nature. Um, so it, it's a very intensive monitoring program. We don't, um, given the depth that we are below these stations, I don't anticipate any uh, any issues. Um, and uh, I think um, it, it's quite a different situation than, than it was experienced at, uh, at uh, Eglinton Crosstown. Great, thanks so much, Richard. And our last question comes from John. John, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and my question, I, I, uh, I th I, it seems as though it may be 
after the fact and a question that is all you know, the answer is already given um there were several options as far as uh, access for tunnel boring uh you've chosen to go through the Corktown station and use the first parliament site as the staging area for that and one of the op options that that was proposed was the Don Yard, uh, which is obviously a, a, a working area of the city, uh, perhaps in my view, perhaps a little more appropriate for all of the heavy work that will be done to access the tunnel boring, uh, to extract all of the, all, you know, all of the, uh, the aggregate or whatever it is underground and, and to ship that away. How did you come to the decision that the disruption at Corktown First Parliament site was going to be less than that would it would be uh, to go through the Dawn Yard? And is there any opportunity to to re you know to just think about that again? That's my question. Hey, it's uh, Richard here. It's a uh, that's a great question, and uh, it's one actually we looked at quite intensively. Um, uh, we looked at using the Don Yard as a, as a launch point for the uh, tunnel boring machines, and that was uh, considered quite a quite a bit. Um, the the fact is, there's unfortunately just not enough area in the Don Yard, and the uh, interaction with the uh, tracks in that area uh, make it very difficult to to uh, support a tunneling operation at, at that spot. Um, I think naturally, you know. Would have been easier easier for all in in some ways if we could make that work, but unfortunately it just uh, it just doesn't work. And uh, the 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 disruption to the go train operations and uh, uh, you know in in that area uh, would would uh, basically rendered that option not feasible. Uh, but it, it it's a good suggestion and definitely one we considered quite a bit uh, in developing where we would start construction from. And Richard, um, you know, one of the other things that we often do when we're um, planning these is we try to reuse an excavation um, in order for the yeah, tunnel launch good. to happen. So in this instance, um, Corktown Station, we have to dig that uh, that hole anyways. Um, so what we'll do is we'll build the hole big enough to support both the station and the tunnel launch site. So it becomes a very effective and efficient way for us to uh, to build and and stage the uh, uh, the site and uh, as as you know from the uh, the probably the relief line south days we were over in the uh, the BMW site launching tunnel boring machines from there and that was a very large expansive site you you need a very large site in order to properly stage these uh, operations so um, that's uh, that's the the long and the short of it and now we'll pass it back to Joseph. Okay, well, thank you for that, Malcolm. And thank you, Jackie. And thank you to all of the questioners who were in the Zoom room. Uh, Jackie, you mentioned uh, that there were some people who wanted to ask supplementary questions. And because we are just a bit past our, uh, our end time, um, they didn't get a chance to do that. So I just like to point out that this is part of a process. This was not a one-off. Um, and if you had a question and you didn't get a chance to ask it, um, the written question widget is still working on the site and it'll be working overnight before we close it down to start to get it ready for answers. So if you didn't get a chance just now to ask your question verbally, you can, uh, you can ask it on the site. In addition, uh, at the top of the page, there is a contact us button. If you click the contact us button, you can see the email for uh, the uh, Metrolinx people. You can send them an email and you can join the mailing list so that you can receive more information in future because there will be more meetings. Watch this space. There's a live meetings button there as well that shows you the videos of previous meetings if you want to get caught up or future meetings and there's also a button right here on the page if you are in the community and have special concerns and want to meet one-to-one -one with Metrolink staff, there's a book a meeting button. So again, this was not your only chance to have input. 
Um, there are many opportunities. This space will be here, so it will provide a record of tonight and something to build on. Thank you again for your participation tonight. There was a lot of meeting, a lot of information presented and some good straightforward questions, which are the best kind of questions. So until the next event, please stay safely home, stay safe and good night. <laughs>